Imagine you had a gigantic cannon with a barrel 100 miles long, and it fires rounds at twice the speed of sound. Instead of cannonballs, your payload in this fantastical cannon, loads of precious diamonds, sparkling, timeless diamonds, from little bitty engagement ring dazzler sizes all the way up to the lunkers fancied by cat burglars in the movies. Imagine piles of these heaped into a giant ball, blasted out of your cannon like a super fancy comet of bling. Where would you aim it? Before you suggest firing the diamonds into your own bank vault for safekeeping, remember, these diamonds will be supersonic. They zip from the cannon at Mach 2, ahead of their own sound, three times faster than a commercial jet. So if you shoot the diamond cannon there, you won't have a bank left standing afterwards. Come to think of it, maybe the diamond cannon is kind of starting to give you Death Star vibes. You'll want to make sure it doesn't fall into the wrong hands. Wild as it sounds, these massive and mysterious cannons actually exist in nature, excluding meteorites which carry in diamonds from space sometimes. All the diamonds on Earth are cooked up deep inside the planet. In these cannons, they're the only way diamonds can make it up to the surface. Some diamond cannon locations are well known, others lost to time. Still, their dim traces present us rockhounds a riddle, and diamonds found in unexpected places often hint that a diamond cannon is nearby. One such place is the Great Lakes region of the United States, usually better known for its hot dish than its gemstones. But when it comes to anomalous jewels, the landscape is peppered like a tater tot casserole, and delightfully salted with diamonds, too. These treasures puzzle geologists and flicker in the dreams of Midwestern rockhounds, myself included. Somewhere out in that magical realm of deep woods and shining waters, the origin of the Great Lakes gems remains hidden. A lost diamond cannon, broken down, busted up, clogged and just nasty with jewels. Likely enough treasure to make a dragon jealous. Boom. Here's the thing about our planet. The super rare goodies, gold and silver and gemstones, things that we call treasure, they're rare on the surface because they're made way down deep, much of it even further than modern drills can reach. So they're kind of sealed off from us. And diamonds form all the way down here, 120 miles under the continents, where the conditions are just crushing. We're in the basement of Earth's crust now, on our way to the mantle, an underworld of extreme pressure and temperature, and just a real wild place to be. Is there a certain color that comes to mind when you envision Earth's mantle? The mantle's usually shown as a red-hot ocean of fiery liquefied rock, but get this, it's actually green. The mantle is made mostly of silica. Up on the surface, we know silica by many names, and its solid form is rocks we like to collect, like agate and jasper and opal and even beach sand. But down here, it's a glassy mixture. It's rich in crystals of garnet and pyroxene and quartz and enough olivine to light the place up greener than krypton. And they're diamonds too, glowing at several thousand degrees. Right now, the mantle far under your feet is a glitter with pure diamonds. But at that distance, they're as unattainable as though they were on the other side of the Milky Way. Fortunately for us sparkly, rock-loving, surface-dwelling, non-mole people, our planet has diamond cannons. Diamond pipes, as they're called, are a form of diatribe, and that's a word geologists use to be polite when talking about Earth's blowholes. Our planet uses diatremes to load material from way down deep and shoot it up to the surface with unbelievable force. Over a billion years ago, most of the diamonds on Earth were cooked up down here. And here they'd stay forever, if not for what I'm going to tell you about next. Magma draws an explosive combo of chemicals from surrounding mantle rock and BAM! It lights up like a supernova. A torrent of mantle material, including our diamonds, launches upwards, gaining speed every moment. 
It's a superheated diamond cannonball, heaving through ascending layers of the planet, gathering all kinds of minerals in its blazing journey up, up, up. Here comes the really risky part. As it rises, the surrounding pressure drops. Without the weight of so much earth overhead and without that pressure, the diamonds are at a constant risk of losing their ultra-condensed cubic atomic structure. It's very easy for the diamond's atomic structure to slip at this point, in which case they turn to graphite, you know, pencil lead, or vaporize to carbon dioxide completely. In order to survive this part of the journey, the diamonds need to pass through this low pressure zone super fast and reach the surface where they can quickly cool and stabilize. Countless are lost along the way, and many surviving diamonds acquire a husk of graphite on their way up. This one's cruising though. It's done 120 miles in under five minutes. Looks like this shot's gonna make it through just fine. Titanic vertical pressure keeps the pipe narrow, just a few meters wide, until right at the very end. Near the surface, with less rock overhead, the resistance drops and the pipe flares open. Finally, the pipe widens up to 1,000 times and the shot blasts through to the sky at Mach 2. When the smoke clears, a strange field of wreckage sizzles and hardens and glimmers in the sun. This diamond-bearing debris is called kimberlite, and solidifying, it jams the pipe from the surface all the way to its root in the mantle. For all the treasure within, kimberlite as a whole is kind of meh looking. It wears down really quickly, and it nurses plant life, so it's really good at blending in and disappearing into the environment. But the jewels inside kimberlite are much more durable, and once they're weathered free, they charm the human eye like stars in the night sky. We are transfixed and sometimes flat out intoxicated by these gems from the belly of the earth. Most diamonds have been found in other parts of the world, but in 1897, a team drilling a well on a farm in Wisconsin found a hard stone, warm yellow color of unknown identity. They took the peculiar pebble to a jeweler in the big city. Let's call him Gollum who said it was a 16.25 carat topaz and bought it for one dollar. Not long after the sale, everyone realized it was actually a giant diamond, and of course the farmers wanted it back, but Gollum refused. He then sold his precious, dubbed the Eagle Diamond, to Tiffany's and Company for $850. With these proceeds, Gollum formed a diamond mining company and claimed to discover more diamonds at the site, along with other precious and semi-precious stones. A mining boom quickly followed, and when a famous gemologist visited the site and took a look at the most recent discoveries, he noticed they all differed in appearance from the original Eagle Diamond. After a bit of gumshoe work, he identified the new stones to be of African origin. Gollum had faked the new discoveries, so that was the end of the Great Eagle Diamond rush. Eventually, the tycoon J.P. Morgan bought the Eagle Diamond he donated it to the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, where it was on public display until 1964, when it was stolen, never to be recovered. Though Gollum the jeweler faked his finds, the following decades saw many more legitimate diamond discoveries made throughout the Great Lakes region. Gems found scattered willy-nilly. And there have been other intriguing Great Lakes finds as well, including gold. During the Great Depression of the 1930s, people panned for gold in the sands of Indiana. They found plenty of it too, but they found it powderized, an unimaginable fortune, crushed to dust and tilled into the soil at large. So what's going on in the Great Lakes region? Random diamonds, pulverized gold mixed in with the sand? What could be the cause of all that strangeness? Glaciers. Unlike the Klondike, where gold was found in fat nuggets, this region had a season of brutal glaciation. During the Ice Age, it was capped in a shell of glaciers up to a mile thick. So Great Lakes gold, along with everything else on the surface, was gouged and crushed to glitter and bulldozed under gliding mountains of ice. Rocks were picked up and moved hundreds of miles over thousands of years. And Great Lakes diamonds were in the glacial crush right alongside gold, but they were much sturdier, so they weathered the journey in one piece. Their soft kimberlite sources, the diamond cannons, 
Those were milled flour and buried thousands of years ago by glacial deposits. So we find diamonds here and there, but nobody knows exactly where the diamond cannons are hidden. They might even be hidden under the Great Lakes themselves. This is where geologists and rock hounds, just like you and me, come in. Working like detectives, collecting clues, finding patterns, decoding a story etched in the land. The traces are everywhere. Erratic boulders of distantly sourced Canadian stone sitting in some random place in the Great Lakes states. Directional tracks carved by glaciers pointing cryptically toward an origin. Geologists suggest somewhere between Indianapolis and the Odish Mountains of Quebec. That's the likely location of the Lost Diamond Cannon. This much is certain. It's out there somewhere. Maybe new tools like LiDAR or machine learning will be deployed in the search. Maybe in our lifetime. Maybe by you. Perhaps you can read the rocks in a new way. Interpret the clues for yourself. Find some secret pattern. And blaze your own trail to the hidden location. Here's to your next adventure, rock hounds. Whatever it may be. In whichever magical corner of the planetary surface you ramble, have fun out there. <laughs>